Resentment is the nothing personal word of the day, and it is the first day of December 2022. Resentment is the word used by Aaron Rodgers yesterday, the quarterback of the Packers, who likely shouldn't be the quarterback of the Packers anymore, but only is the quarterback of the Packers because they signed him to that very interesting three-year extension when everyone was crying and sad that he hadn't been re-signed, that he wasn't being respected because the Packers saw, uh, drafted Jordan Love. And then they gave him this deal that was complicated to the point of it was done by a bunch of cap nerds who said, hey, let's give him a three-year deal, but we'll make it like a five-year deal for cap purposes. And then there's dead money and live money and sort of dead money, bonus money, workout money, off-season appearance money. All it adds up to is that Aaron Rodgers, when he signed this deal, when he got guaranteed like 150 million bucks, it was really a one-year deal. And while no one believed this at the time, we put it in a wait to see that Aaron Rodgers would not be a Packer in 2023. So the Packers this year start off 3-0. and They go to London to play the Giants. Everything's coming up roses. They are winning at the half. They're on their way. Maybe back-to-back-to-back -back -back MVPs, even though Rodgers had no one to throw it to, as his good friend Devontae Adams was jettisoned out of Green Bay, went to join his college teammate Carr in Las Vegas. The Packers lose in London. They fly home, and they really haven't won since. Maybe one game. I think they're now 4-8 and eight as they head into this week's weekend's game. So yesterday, Aaron Rodgers went public with a conversation that was had between the front office and Aaron. And it's a very difficult conversation to have with your franchise superstar, arguably the best Packer in history, though he's won the same number of Super Bowls as Brett Favre and won fewer than Bart Starr. So maybe he's not the best of all time, but very hard to say to your player, hey, it's done. Players never think they're done. It's so strange to me. When, it, when everybody else sees that their skills have diminished to the point that they just can't win or the team isn't good enough to overcome their diminished ability or they're still as good but they're a part of a team game and the team is not as good and there's no ability to build around them, whatever the case is, when it's time to move on, you sit with the player and it's a very tough decision in the beginning first decision is who do we do this with do we speak to Aaron directly do we invite his agent to be a part of it his advisors his family do we do it at his house do we do it at the stadium do we do it in the clubhouse do we do it up in the executive offices you try to figure out what is going to be the least painful from a PR standpoint we never had in mind, and obviously it's something I think about all these years later, maybe we should have had it more in mind, but we never have in mind the feeling of the veteran who's just a young man. I mean, when you're telling players they're done being productive for you, keep in mind they're generally not even 40 years old yet. You're, and you're telling them that their job, what they have done their whole lives, that they are not going to be able to do anymore. And if they are going to be able to do it, it's not going to be with the team that they've done it with for a long time, the team they're comfortable with, et cetera. So the reason why we keep PR in mind is that I never really used to care what the player's reaction would be. It'd be nice to have player buy-in for the fact that they're not productive anymore. But more often than not, you're not going to get that buy-in because they don't agree. They don't see it that way. Very few people see when their skills have diminished because their brain tells them their body is still producing the way it used to when they were lauded as the greatest. So they sit down with Aaron Rodgers and they say, listen, you know, if we are eliminated from the playoffs, which could happen as early as this week or next week, if they lose – we're probably going to go ahead and take a look at Jordan Love. When they sat with Rodgers to tell him that, they weren't asking him. You don't have to ask Aaron Rodgers whether or not he's okay with not playing. If you're ready after three years to finally play Jordan Love and figure out what you have as you're approaching the end of his initial rookie deal, 
You're going to do it. And if you're running the Packers, you've got to play Jordan Love this year. You cannot let Aaron Rodgers finish this season. So you sit with Aaron Rodgers and you say, hey, we're going to go a different direction. We're going to keep you on the team. We're not going to release you because it is not fiscally responsible to release you at this moment. So you're going to be the clipboard quarterback. You okay with that? And Aaron Rodgers had an opportunity to digest it and then to give his view of it. And he took the high road. Almost. He was so close to being good. He said, I'd love to finish the season. I hope we run the table. But I understand he said, this is a business. And there's a lot of us kind of older guys who play a decent amount and they might want to see some younger guys play. All right. Not like great. Like it would have been nice to talk about Jordan Love. It would have been nice to be a mentor. I mean, listen, the great example that Brett Favre showed Aaron Rodgers, it would have been nice for Aaron Rodgers to show that to Jordan Love. I kid, obviously. We are who what we're modeled, aren't we? You ever thought about what you've turned into both personally and professionally? It's what you've seen, what you've lived, what you've experienced. But then he was asked, what about your health? Because there's all this talk. He's got a thumb. He's got ribs. He's, this is why the Packers aren't winning. Forget the fact that he has no one to throw the ball to. But whatever the reason is, the question was asked, what about if you're sitting not because the team's out of contention, but because you're not well? And it's better for you to get ready for next year. This is Aaron Rodgers' chance to say, listen, that's a great idea. I want to be ready because I believe this team can compete. I love the Packers. I love Green Bay. And I want to bring a second Super Bowl to this great town. That would have been a great answer. Instead, he said, when asked whether it would be a better course of action for him to sit until he's fully healthy, he said, I mean, that's an assumption that this place won't look any different next year. Again, that's part of the conversation. That's so brilliant. Aaron, you're not having a conversation with the Packers. The Packers are telling you what they're going to do, and they're trying to make it hurt as little as possible for the fans, not for you. And you telling executives that, hey, that's an assumption this place won't look any different. That means that you know what the Packers know, what was told to you when you signed your extension, which was what you wanted, that this would be your last year with Green Bay, but you didn't want it to be announced as such. You didn't want the distraction, they didn't want the distraction, and so the announcement's not made. But don't pretend as though you don't know exactly what's happening. It would have been better when asked about next year to simply say, listen, it's far too early to discuss next year. That would take away the focus from this year. And wherever we are in the playoff situation, we're here to win as many games as we can and put on the best show we can for our fans in Green Bay and around the world. And on top of that, I'm going to be focused every single week on helping Jordan Love become the best quarterback he can be. That would have been an amazing response. But nope. That'll do it for Aaron Rodgers. But he has no resentment. That's very nice. The reason resentment was word of the day is that he said, hey, if I'm benched, I'll tell you, I'm approaching that with an open mind without any bitterness or resentment. Oh my, did I laugh at that. They're not asking you, Aaron. They're telling you. How many of you were watching World Cup games during your workday? Because of the time difference and because of the time of year, well, although during the summer we all work too, unless you're in school, when the World Cup is supposed to be. Everyone remember the fact that World Cup is supposed to be during the summer, but it couldn't be during the summer because in Qatar you can't play soccer during the summer because you can't breathe during the summer even like in an air conditioned facility. So they moved it to November and December. Anyway, so the World Cup's going on 
And during the initial games, the first two games of the group stages, you got the 5 a.m., the 8 a.m., the 11 a.m., and the 2 p.m. local time, Eastern, if you're Eastern. And you're watching the, every game. And you're, you're okay because you can focus on one game. Now, in the game threes of the group stage, much like the last game of the MLB uh, regular season, I don't know why I keep saying the. The last game of Major League Baseball's regular season, they play at the same time because they thought that'd be exciting because they don't want teams to not play their best players if they their playoff lives depend on another team's result. There'd be an unfair advantage if they got to wait to see what happened. So what soccer does, they play the final game of the group stage, game three. They play it at the same time. So all four teams in the group played at the same time, which means you have to have two screens to watch two games that matter. So yesterday, 2 p.m., I'm figuring out which game to watch. I speak to Coca, who is my sensei when it comes to World Cup and which games to watch and what all the scenarios are. So I am locked into the scenarios before you get it on Fox or FS1 where they put it underneath the score thumbnail. They say, if results hold, I didn't even know what live standings were before this World Cup. And I admit it, I'm learning and I'm loving it. I'm so into it. So I'm watching these games happen and Argentina is playing Poland and then Mexico is playing Saudi Arabia. And anything can happen. And I'm watching Lionel Messi because he's who I wanna watch. And if Argentina loses, they can be eliminated, which would be the end of Messi's career in the World Cup because he's not gonna play in four years in the US. Maybe. I can't imagine he'll make the Argentinian team. And that'll be right when he's starting to play in at Major League Soccer. So maybe he will be good enough. <laughs> so anyway, so I'm watching and I call Coca in the middle and I say, what, what, what do we do here? What, I know it's Lionel. Sorry, Coca. What do I do here? And he said, dual screens. And I hadn't thought of that. So I had my phone on the end of the Mexico game. The TV was on the end of the Argentina-Poland game. And the way it was working is that if Argentina scored another goal and they were dominating Poland, Poland was going to lose and not qualify for the knockouts. Or if Mexico scored another goal over Saudi Arabia, they were going to knock out Poland. So there were two ways. So guess what? There's an offsides goal, it gets called back. Argentina misses by an inch or two. It is total mayhem right between 3.30 and four, which is the last half hour of the game. And I'm watching, thinking to myself, what could we do better in North America? That was literally what I was thinking about while watching. How many fans in baseball are doing this? Or in the NFL, what it's become, it's the Red Zone channel. That's what we're doing, right? We're watching the Red Zone channel, but we're watching it because of fantasy and gambling. We're not watching it because we are so interested in the outcome of the game. In baseball, when the games are all on at once, it's a total regional product. You're watching your own team play, and that's only if your own team is in the playoff race. But you're keeping an eye on the scoreboard, which, of course, is in the outfield if you're at the game. But in soccer, every time down, every time there's a rush toward the goal, every time there's a corner kick or an other set piece or a free kick, it could be the difference between making the knockouts or being knocked out. And it was just further proof to me that there is nothing we can do here in North America to match that level of tension, that level of excitement. It was surreal watching the end of these games where you don't know what could happen. The the closest I can come up with is the back and forth in the NHL in a game seven of a playoff game when every time rushing down the ice, there could be a goal scored and that'd be the end of the series and one team would go home and one team would advance. That's the only thing I could think of. The other thing that I was thinking of while watching this game are the coaches. So I thought going into the World Cup, happy to admit it, I thought that the coaches of all of the teams were the nationality of the teams. I didn't realize that there were, like Iran, I thought that the coach was Iranian or Mexico, I thought the coach was Mexican. So I'm watching and I'm learning that that's not how it works. 
like Saudi Arabia's coach, I realize from Coca, is French. So I'm thinking about how that works. And the way it works is that what these teams do, the international teams, is they go and they figure out these national teams, who is the best coach available in the world who can help a team. And the best coaches will go to the best international teams. The sort of second tier coaches will go to the second tier teams. Saudi Arabia is not a first tier team. But if you have a chance to coach in Saudi Arabia, my assumption is this guy, this Frenchman, is getting paid a tremendous amount of money. That's my assumption. And he had to decide, listen, I, I, I can't speak the language of my players, which is totally crazy to have a manager or a coach who doesn't speak the language of the team. You then require a translator to communicate anything, both in practice and during games. It makes zero sense to me why you would do that. It's hard enough when you've got a Japanese translator on your baseball team and a Spanish translator, and you've got a manager or a president who doesn't speak Japanese or Spanish. It means that all communication with that player is on a very, very cursory, easy level. You don't get into deep conversations about your team. I was able to do it with Ichiro because he spoke English, but at the end of the day, for players who speak no English, it's very difficult to talk about sort of the nuances of the game. And people always say, but the game has, it's a universal language. That's not right. Maybe there's a universal word for rushing the net or what the formations are in soccer or for the fact that there's three outs in an inning in baseball. But when you are trying to truly have a relationship with a player, try to coach a player, try to help a player, speaking the language matters. Saudi Arabia didn't matter. I guess they had a translator come and deal with it as the best as I can figure. And Saudi Arabia, of course, is knocked out. What do you do if you're uh, Saudi Arabia or you're any country that's knocked out? You've worked for years toward this World Cup and then it's gone, right? Three games, you're knocked out, half the teams. It's sort of like being upset in the first round of the NCAA tournament. You're despondent, but you know you can get back and start again the next year. But in the World Cup, you're now waiting to 26. So Mexico loses the game. Their manager is from Argentina, and he had coached in MLS also for Atlanta United. His contract runs out at the final whistle. He walks off the field, off the pitch, into the locker room, gets his bag out of the locker room, and he's done. Like the Mexico national team now needs a coach. Maybe he'll they'll get the Saudi Arabian coach. All right, Coca, I want to talk about what's going on in Saudi Arabia with Ronaldo. And we had a question from an audience member about it. You know what I want? <laughs> I want to talk to Samson. So you want to talk to Samson. So talk about Saudi Arabia. And this was a perfect transition. David, hello. What are your thoughts on the offer made by Saudi Arabia to Ronaldo? What impact would accepting it have on his legacy? Well, thanks for asking that fit in perfectly with the show. Did you see this ridiculousness? This makes the money given to Phil Mickelson look reasonable by Saudi Arabia and the Live Tour. Apparently, Al Nasser, which is a team in the Saudi Arabian League, has offered Ronaldo a three-year, $360 million deal to join their team. He is able to leave the EPL. There is a deal in place that would have the Saudi Arabian team pay him the remainder of his salary from this year, plus add on a bunch of years going forward at about $120 million per year. His response when asked about this has been, I'm not thinking about it. I am focused on Portugal and the World Cup. That is a top 10 horse hockey statement. I would like you to tell me whether you have the ability to continue focusing on your task at hand when your boss walks into your office and says, listen, 
I think we're going to sign you to a three-year deal and you're making $80,000 a year, but we're going to increase your pay to $2 million per year. But listen, stay focused. We'll talk about it once we get through these next three weeks. Are you kidding? Oh, you're going to be totally focused. You're not going to think about that extra money in your pocket one time. Ronaldo's trying to convince you that he is so good at what he does and so uber focused that he's not thinking about it. My representatives are dealing with it, he said. No, they're not. Of course, Ronaldo knows whether or not he's going to take that money. What he's doing is using this time to figure out whether or not it makes business sense, which means they're calling all of his off-field sponsors and wondering whether or not they will continue to sponsor him if he takes Saudi Arabian blood money. Then he is doing a career calculation with his accountant, with his agents, with his lawyers, about what money he would make when he's done playing. Because there's plenty of players, and Ronaldo's one of them, who has a chance post-career to continue being one of the highest earning athletes in the world, given his social media profile, given his looks, given everything about his ability to earn money. I think he's like the second or third highest earning athlete in the world right now. And that's before he would get this money from Saudi Arabia, which is totally outrageous, might I add. Ronaldo as a player is not worth $120 million a year, hard stop. But if you're going to get someone to come to Saudi Arabia, if you're going to get someone to agree, like with the Live Tour, you think the Live Tour would have been good if they said to Mickelson, hey, just we'll give you like a couple million bucks. Do you want to try to screw the PGA? He'd be like, bugger off. Of course, I'm not going to do that. Hey, how about 100 million guaranteed? Hell yeah, I'm on my way. But can we pay that over 20 years so I don't lose it all? When you are trying to build and wash your reputation, you've got to overpay. There is no EPL team who is going to offer Ronaldo $120 million a year. It's never going to happen. So he goes and he thinks about what his future is going to be. He then does some math. He speaks to his shoe company. Is that deal still going to be in place? And then he decides, would people think I'm a sellout? Will I have to answer questions about taking money from Saudi Arabia, about the killing of journalists, about the misogyny, the racism? Am I going to have to think about that? Am I going to have to answer that? There's another best of athlete who has passed his prime who was offered this money. People don't remember. Tiger Woods was offered close to a billion dollars to go to live. He did the business math and he said no. Ronaldo, without a doubt, is not going to Saudi Arabia. Ronaldo's had a problem with Manchester United. It's been well documented. For those of you who don't follow football, remember when he gave that interview and he blew up the head coach and he blew up the team and the executives. He basically was saying they don't appreciate me. They don't think I'm good anymore. He only played four of the last seven. He didn't play in four of the last seven major matches of Man U, by the way, for whatever reason. You could imagine the reason. So he's gone for Man U. But if you are the advisor to Ronaldo, you do not let him go to Saudi Arabia. Ronaldo is like Tiger Woods. Tiger Woods didn't take the billion dollars to go to live because he didn't think that his reputation would be able to withstand it. And he cares about his reputation because he finances his lifestyle with his reputation. That's why the whole Ambien incident and the whole divorce and the whole Applebee stuff was such a problem for him and how he had to go on the redemption tour, which he's still on. Ronaldo knows that the stain of Saudi Arabia is not a $360 million stain. It's not even a $700 million stain because of what he's going to be able to do over the next 20 to 25 to 30 years. So Saudi Arabia is shooting too high. They've got to get mid-level players and overpay them. They've got to get desperate gamblers and overpay them. That's the best plan. 
Not someone who's, what is he going to, can you imagine Ronaldo moving his whole family to Saudi Arabia for the season? Or what's he going to commute back to Europe? So before everybody gets their selves in a tizzy, I believe that Saudi Arabia knew they had to overpay someone like Ronaldo in order to get him. And they're willing to go to whatever numbers necessary to get him. And they're going to try to make it so he has to say yes. But there is no number where Ronaldo will say yes. So my wait to see, which is when I tell you something's going to happen, I'll revisit it. When it doesn't happen, I revisit it. Here it is. Ronaldo will turn down Saudi Arabia. All right, when we come back, we're going to review a new Aubrey Plaza movie, and we're going to talk about whether it matters who goes to a party. Yeah, we're talking about Russell Wilson and Ciara. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Nothing Personal. It's Matthew Koch and David Sampson coming to you almost live. Not really live. Maybe we'll do some live shows. So many of you have asked us to go live that you've asked us to do an extra 45 minutes per day. We'll see what happens over the new year. But in the meantime, please keep rating, reviewing, subscribing. Hit the subscribe button on YouTube, Nothing Personal with David Sampson. Thanks for making it through the gauntlet of commercials. So I'm, I watched a movie called Ingrid Goes West. It was with Aubrey Plaza and Elizabeth Olsen. Elizabeth Olsen is the sister of Mary-Kate and Ashley Olsen. I've been a fan of Elizabeth Olsen for a very long time. I've been a fan of Aubrey Plaza for a very long time. This movie, Ingrid Goes West, is a movie that could only have been made this year. It's a movie about a woman who has an obsession with other women on social media and then stalks these women, befriends these women, and wants to live the life that these women supposedly live because of their social media. Aubrey Plaza is creepy in this movie. She's fascinating in this movie. I love her as an actress in all of her movies. Movies, Coca. No, I've not seen Parks and Rec yet. But the point of discussing Ingrid Goes West and why you should see it is the point of social media. How many times do I go through Instagram or Facebook or Twitter and I'm looking and I'm saying to myself, wow, I'm missing something. Someone has a better life than I do. Someone is having more fun, seeing more things. Someone is flexing in a way that I wish I could. And then it gets proven to me that I'm totally wrong about what I think, where that person is not in a happy relationship, that person is not happy at work, that person doesn't have the type of money that they're pretending to have on social media, that person is not as good looking because all of a sudden there's filters that make you look totally different than the way you actually are in real life. How many times do we need to be shown that social media is not real before our brain tells us it's okay to see what other people are doing and have a modicum of cynicism or some sort of self-love where we're not judging what we are seeing, we're judging who we are and what we know. How long will it take? Will that be the end of social media when that happens? Is the reason we all post on social media or many people do so that there's jealousy People think you're better looking than you are. I don't, I don't get that because let's say you're on a dating site and you use these filters, you're eventually gonna meet the person in person. And then if it goes well, you're eventually gonna see the person in the morning and you'd be like, wow, that's not what I expected. That's false advertising. And that's been going on for decades before social media. You'd lie about your age. You'd lie about your marital status. You lie about all sorts of things. You lie about your height. But eventually, if you actually enter into a meaningful relationship with honesty, then what? Then you have to say that all the rebar that created this relationship was based on mud and not bar. I don't know. Ingrid Goes West is a great example of this. And it should show every one of us What's wrong with going filterless? Yeah, we got warts, so do you. Yeah, we fart, so do you. When the media gets its fingers into players 
and it's hooks into players. Let's do hooks, Coco. Ready? Two, six, nine. And this is the transition from uh, the movie review. When the media gets their hooks into a player, it is very rare that they let go. I always pictured it like that carnival game where you've got the impossible to grab prizes and you put money into the arcade game and you're trying to win a prize and you've got like this, um, what's it called, Coca, please? When you have uh, the, the clips that you maneuver with a joystick and you drop them and try to grab a toy and then it never works and you grab air and then you put more money in the machine. The media is really good at grabbing something. And the media has been all over Russell Wilson because he signed that huge contract with Denver and Denver has been terrible. And there's been rumors coming out of Denver that he was not a good teammate, that he's not liked in the locker room. There were people like uh, uh, Lynch and Sherman in Seattle who came out after he left Seattle and saying, listen, this guy was not exactly, it's called the claw machine, yes. And uh, thank you, Coca. That must have been hard to find, actually. Where he, uh, in Seattle, he may not have been as beloved as people thought. You can sort of see it, right? But you don't know him. Never had him as a player, never lived with him. But he goes to Denver, and Denver committed what to me is a cardinal sin, and it's been going on for decades, where you trade for a player, you extend that player. Ask Dave Dombrowski about Dontrell Willis. You extend a player without ever seeing the player, without living with the player, and then all of a sudden you realize, wow, this player is not as effective as we thought he was, not worth the money that we thought he was worth, and now we're stuck. The Broncos are stuck with Russell Wilson in a way that is immovable, period. He will be a Bronco next year. There is no one who's going to trade for him. He, he's an overrated quarterback who had his best days as a Seahawk a decade ago. But he goes to the Broncos, and then the same sort of stuff starts to bubble up. Of course, their coach, first-year coach, Nathaniel Hackett, is not doing well, likely to be fired. Their first-year owner, who is the wealthy Walmart heir, he's trying to figure out how he's going to spend his money to make the team better. Totally expected better, different results. But yesterday was too much. Too much. Word came out about a Russell Wilson birthday party that was thrown by his wife, the famous singer Ciara. Is it Sierra or Ciara? I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong. And they are the power couple of Denver and Sierra. And it was reported that only half the team, there was a leak in the party, that only half of the Broncos were in attendance at Russell Wilson's birthday party. And what that shows, what it shows is that he's not beloved. It shows that he is divisive in the locker room. It shows the defense doesn't like him because the offense stinks and the offense doesn't like him because he stinks. Guess what? The attendance at Russell Wilson's birthday party means nothing. There has not been one time other than the death of a player where we had full team participation in anything. Players on a team of 25 do not all get along. Players on a team of, what is it in football, 56? You think you can get 50 plus players to do one thing? Are you kidding me? You could offer them the greatest party experience, the Hollywood party. You could offer that they are going to get to be with all celebrities. And they're going to get free Rolexes. And you will not get full participation. You can have a party where a player says, I will pay for you to fly to Vegas on a private jet and give you a million dollars each to gamble with. And you will not get full participation. There is no scenario where teams do things as a team that are not required by the collective bargaining agreement or are not part of their contractual obligation. Those are the only two scenarios. So under the CBA, they have to make certain community appearances. 
under their own contract, there are community appearance clauses. There are certain off-season things they have to do and certain in-season things they have to do. But other than that, good luck. Clubhouses are made of clicks. Sometimes it's defense offense. Sometimes it is the color of the skin, the language that's spoken. Sometimes it's neither. That's why in baseball, we're so keen to have a player like Martin Prado, as an example. You may not know that name, but you should. He was terrific in his time where he could be on the with the Latino clique and he could be with the white clique, the black clique, everybody he was a part of. So that's sort of a clubhouse glue is what we call a player like that. Someone who can float between all the different groups of people who are hanging out. And make no mistake, there are groups of people hanging out on a football team just like they are on a baseball team. And a basketball team, even with 15 members, has the same thing. So the narrative that is trying to be promoted that we should learn anything or be informed in any way about the relationship that Russell Wilson has with his teammates because only half the team showed up to his birthday party, stop it. Just stop it. There's no issue there. People are looking back at the last game. Remember when Russell Wilson had a uh, an argument on the sideline with one of his defensive players? I think it was a guy named Powell, if I remember correctly. And everyone was showing, well, there's an example of why Russell Wilson is so disrespected. And then he had a party. I bet he wasn't there. Do you know the number of times that best friends argue inside a clubhouse? You are with that person every day. Of course, do you ever fight with your friends? I actually don't, but there are people who do. There are people who then go up and down like a roller coaster with their friends or with their group. This person's in the group, then they're out of the group. Is this not sounding familiar to anybody? A clubhouse or a locker room is the exact same thing. Everybody relax in Denver, including you, Javi. It's all gonna be okay. Do you think George Hill knew what the spread was of the Knicks-Bucks game? George Hill goes to the line, up five with two seconds left at the Garden last night. We had the Bucks giving five and a half. I needed one of two. If you bet you're a late better, you had the Bucks giving six. He needs two of two to push. If you bet the Knicks, you're hoping at six for a push, maybe a win. Do you think George Hill knew? I find it hard to believe that he didn't. By the way, two of two would have been to win by seven. Sorry, Coco. All right, do that again. Sorry. If you're George Hill, do you know that the spread is six and that you're down and you're up five with one second to go at the line? And if you hit both your team covers, if you miss both, then the Knicks cover. And if you hit one of two, then it's a push. Do you think he's aware of that? I've asked players and players have pretended that they didn't know the line to a game. Hey, are we favored today? That's not the case in basketball and football and certainly not the case in baseball anymore. Because of the proliferation of gambling, because of the TVs that are on in the clubhouse that all have the lines of the game underneath the game, no matter what network you're on, even MLB Network has now embraced gambling. Players know the line. I'm not saying George Hill bet the Bucks or the Knicks at all. I'm saying it's pretty amazing that the line was six and how many times do we see this where it comes down to something that crazy? Meaningless. George Hill hitting one free throw or two free throws had nothing to do with the outcome of the game. Maybe you shouldn't even shoot those free throws. Just end the game. Now nah, the players need the stats. We won. We had the Bucks minus five and a half and they won by six. We're 137 and 117. What a bizarre end, but we got it. All right, Thursday night football is tonight. We've got the Buffalo Buffs against the Tom Brady-less New England Patriots. The Bills are giving four in New England. This is a sucker bet. People are saying, God, the, the Bills have been struggling. Josh Allen is no longer MVP consideration. Bill Belichick has found a way to win without Tom Brady. They are H-O triple T. We're getting four at home. We're taking it. Sucker bet. Bills minus four over the Patriots. That is our pick of the day. 
Okay, let's talk about Tony Clark, if you don't mind, for just a minute, Coca, because something happened that uh, very quietly yesterday. Tony Clark is the head of the Major League Baseball Players Association, and two things happened within the union at an off-season meeting that the union had in Arizona this past week. Number one, there was a brand new subcommittee elected. Do you remember the executive council, the, the top committee of the union? Remember during the collective bargaining agreement last year, it was all those Scott Boris clients, Max Scherzer, et cetera. And do you remember how the final vote was in the CBA? Every team has one vote. There's 30 teams. They each had one vote. Their player rep, their union rep has the vote for whether or not to ratify a new collective bargaining agreement. And then the eight members of the council have a vote. So there's 38 votes and you need 20 to win. And do you remember that all 30 player reps voted to ratify the CBA and all eight members of the council who were run by Boris voted not to ratify the CBA, but the CBA was still ratified. It was a total condemnation of the work that Scott Boris had done during the CBA. Every agent had spoken to all of their other players to say, do not allow Scott Boris and his players to be a part of your union going forward because they don't care about you. Well, there was a new subcommittee elected and Scott Boris's power has disappeared. He now has two players on the committee and that's the end of it. But that shouldn't be a big deal, right? Because there's no new collective bar agreement until 2027. So are players on it now still gonna be around in 2027? Yes. But what about the head of the union? Tony Clark's contract was set to run out. Tony Clark is the greatest thing that's happened to Major League Baseball owners since the advent of the Players Union. The players gave Tony Clark a five-year extension yesterday, so he will be in charge of the new CBA when it is negotiated in the offseason of 2026. And MLB owners are celebrating that because say what you want. The owners have won every negotiation against the players, even this one. All of the things that the union thought they got with the pre-arbitration pool, with the no more service time manipulation. I already told you when analyzing the draft, go back to a previous show, the owners gave exactly what they wanted to give to make the players feel as though they were getting what they want. But what the owners wanted was five years of labor peace and 162 games this past season, and they got it. The players are saying, hey, we wanted just to get full pay, and we got that. We wanted younger players to get more money faster. We got that. We wanted to get rid of the qualifying offer. We didn't get that. That only impacts a few people at the top. It was a win, and I think time will show that for the owners again. Tony Clark is a former player. He can't help it. I'm not saying that he's not a capable, great player or a capable, great man. What I am saying is that his focus historically has not been on economic issues. It's been on player creature comfort issues. The players will argue to you today that Tony Clark has changed, that he now, with the help of John Mayer, with the help of experience, understands the complications inherent in a collective bargain agreement, has a better understanding of the pension issues, the future economic issues, et cetera. And by the way, way to go, Tony. You got the minor league players unionized. Do you realize how little owners care about that? that the minor league players formed the union. They will do with the minor leagues exactly as they want. They will cut the number of teams further if that's what they choose to do. But Tony Clark getting the five-year extension is incredibly surprising to me because I thought at the end of this CBA that Tony Clark would be let go. All the players on the subcommittee would be gotten rid of. And the lead hatchet man, Bruce Meyer, I may have called him John, that's the singer, Bruce would be eliminated as well. But looks like they're running it back with Tony. We'll see how that ends up. 
All right. 10 o'clock today and 2 o'clock. Are you watching? I am. I got to go. That's the end of our show. We'll be back tomorrow for the Friday edition. Have a good December. I can't believe it's the first ready. It's just business. This is nothing personal.